though, we're back in the Shinra, um, Shinra HQ again, and things are just keep going on and on here. I've mentioned a bunch of times before that the pacing of this game is a little bit screwed up. It's not quite as bad as what I had um, seen in Final Fantasy XIII, where the dungeons are just... The game is nothing but dungeons. But in this, the dungeons can be a little long. And at some point, you want to be able to stop at a town and rest a little bit. But the game has the problem of being written and originally developed with the idea of being something where this entire section of the game should only take like four hours or so. Five, five hours, so if it's your first time through, trying to figure out your way through. But in this version, it's like a 30-hour RPG. That four hours gets stretched across 30 hours. Those dungeons that used to take 20 minutes or so are going to have to take like an hour now. So... We've been stuck in the Shinra HQ for a while. Now, the original Shinra HQ, and by that I mean the one in the original game, didn't actually have a whole hell of a lot of combat in it. I mean, it was mostly you first get in there and you perhaps have um, a couple of fights in the lobby or you take the stairs up, and then you have a fight or two once you get to the higher floors. And then you sneak past some guards and you might get into a fight there. But you, for the most part, after that, it calms down a bit and it turns into a bit of a puzzle fest. You have to talk to certain people to get key cards or you have to go and complete little puzzles to get key cards and you're moving on. And then you're sneaking around and you're listening to the Shinra uh, executives doing their meeting and you're sneaking through the bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. Once, the only times that you suddenly started running in the combat, though, was after Genova escaped and all the test subjects got free. But that hasn't happened. And character, or characters weren't captured. They just sort of hid out in Aerith's house, or her uh, apartment, or whatever the hell you want to call it. There, or where she was living in the Shinra HQ when she was a kid. You, you hide there, you weren't captured. So this is a pretty significant change. In the original, you were captured by Rude as you attempted to... After you rescued um, Aerith, and you fought one test subject then. In the elevator, Rude captures you and brings you up to um, uh, Shinra President. And he talks to you for a bit, and then locks you in some jail cells. And then as, overnight... After everybody goes to sleep, that's when all shit hits the fan. In this, though, that never happened. We haven't seen President Shinra yet, or at least the, our characters happen. We've sort of jumped right to the combat. Let's finish this. <laughs> you okay? I am now. <sighs> nice one. Have Cloud and Barrett found anything? Actually, they just found the entrance to the fourth ward. But to unlock it, they have to access the central terminal, which they cannot do from their position. Maybe we can get to it instead. Yeah, let's try. Red 13 is being portrayed a little bit differently, or Nanakia, whatever you want to call him. It's portrayed a little bit differently in this. I'm not sure. Like, I want to see later on in the game, the next chapter or the next couple of chapters, to see how his character develops. Because Red 13, in the early parts of the game, before you run into his hometown, comes across more as disinterested in everybody's story and their fight against Shinra and all that. I mean, he's not really disinterested, but he just sort of plays the role of somebody who's doesn't really care about what they're doing or anything like that. It's only after you go to Cosmo Canyon that he sort of invests himself in the in the uh, mission. And it's not moving. The professor still has plans for us, I presume. For the record, I don't like this one bit. All that remains is the fourth ward. We must trust in Cloud and Barrett to see it through. Thank you. 
in this one, Red's personality is a little harder to pin down. He's not as disinterested in everything as he was in the original game, but he's also... He shows a much stronger personality of being just an asshole. I mean, <laughs> Red seems to even have some strong hatred of Barrett for some reason. It's like, what the hell did Barrett ever do to you? <laughs> you don't even know him, you just sort of ran into him here. I don't know. We'll find out later. Hopefully they do something a little bit better with this character. Most of the Sud characters, I'm talking like Red 13, Sid, Vincent, Yuffie, they were a little thin on the characterization and compared to Cloud. Compared to Barrett, compared to uh, Tifa, Era. Transfusion procedure complete. Commencing test of augmented research specimen. This was a good idea, right? Yep. Well, let's go give the others the news. Kind of always a thing with these JRPG, say. Oftentimes, and it's less of a thing now, but there was a long time where if you had sub-characters, or not, not like the main character, then you have other characters. Let me start over. <laughs> you'll have your main character, who gets most of the character development. Then you'll have a, a so, sort of small core group of other characters. In this case, um, Tifa and Aerith who are sort of like the secondary main characters, who receive somewhat of a lesser level of character development, but still a good amount. Is that you? Yeah. We found an elevator on our side. Good. Glad to hear it. But we can't use it for some reason. Hojo did something. I know it. There's only one thing we can do. We need to head to the fourth ward, just like he wants. We unlocked it on our side. You should be able to get in. Thanks. Wait for it there. Right. Now we head back to that door. I'm not going to have enough time right now to um, express what I'm trying to say. At least this part of the episode. So I'll try to remember to get back to it later. <laughs> later on in this episode. I'm not going to try and remember for a later episode than just end up forgetting anyway. Not that anyone really cares, but... Man, it's a big place. What the freaking hell? What are all these hallways for? Wait a while to be rescued. Guess so. You know, he really likes you. Maybe. Friendly guy, but he has a hard time opening up to people. Well, that makes two of us. He's got your back, though. Makes two of us. Barrett has sort of softened himself a little bit at this point. It was something I found endlessly fascinating in the original game that Barrett and Cloud, Barrett, Barrett and Cloud hated each other. Now, a lot of that has to do with just the two personalities, or the, the personality Cloud is presenting and Barrett's personality clashing. There's some deeper meaning to it that I can't say here. But we're seeing a point where Barrett has started to trust Cloud more. Doesn't see him as such a bad guy, not just a Shinra dog, you know. You hear that? Run! Can't say I know for sure exactly where in the original game Barrett softens his stance on Cloud. Maybe it's seeing that he cares about more than just himself. Because that was, he either saw him as being somebody who, like I was a representative of Shinra, as a former employee of Shinra in fact, that he couldn't trust him. Or maybe it's just that later on, 
when he sees Cloud trying to rescue Aerith and sees that he cares more about somebody than himself or he's willing to risk himself for somebody else that changes his personality or his perspective of Cloud. But Barrett changing his personality is sort of tied back into what I was saying earlier about the, the sort of tertiary uh, player characters having less character development. Oftentimes, and maybe Barrett's not the best example of this, but you would often see in a lot of these um, JRPGs where you had the third tier of characters, and you saw this like Xenogears is a perfect example. Where you have a character that gets introduced, and the character doesn't really... The character will get introduced, and then at some point, possibly not long after they're introduced, there is a moment where that character sort of steps into the forefront, and the story largely becomes about them for a short period of time. And this is the point in which their, all of their character development gets sort of mushed into. So, in Xenogears, let's say the character of Billy. The character of Billy makes a sudden appearance about, I don't know, a third of the way through the first disc or so. And he's present, and his character is pushed to the forefront, and a lot of the story revolves around him for the next couple of hours. And then after that's over, his character retreats to the back, so, like, after the whole ethos thing falls his character retreats to the back, and he doesn't really contribute much to the story after that. Same thing with, um... Okay, what other characters could I say in Xenogears? Okay, so Red 13. In the original Final Fantasy 13, he makes his appearance. He doesn't contribute much to the conversation or anything like that. He's just sort of long for the ride. And he doesn't say or do much at all until you go to Cosmo Canyon. And then you have a section of the story which is devoted entirely to him, his father, his mother, his town, all that kind of stuff. And then after that's over, he, his character arc is basically complete. And he rejoins the party and fights for something bigger than himself. And it's only in this small section of the game, one dungeon, one town, that all of his character development takes place in. triumph <laughs> I'd be disappointed if you didn't yes I believe I have just about all the data that I require then we are ready to proceed to the next stage <laughs> <laughs> yes, we got it to work. Could this be a trap? Don't worry, the elevators are safe. All right, if you say so. I just want to get one more thing and the episode is over. I just want to get one more thing in before I end. That's not to say the characters like Red 13 or 
Billy and Xenogears or anything like that don't have a measure of depth to them. They certainly do. Like, for example, Red 13 pretends to be disinterested in everybody's struggle and everything like that. And he doesn't want to be a part of it. But you see certain moments like at the end of the flashback sequence and when you're in calm back to flashback back to Nibelheim, he just sort of sits there and he doesn't comment or anything like that, acting like he doesn't give a damn. But after everybody leaves, he actually like reveals a little bit about himself. He says something like, uh, what an interesting story, indicating that, yes, he did care and he was sitting there and he was listening to the entire thing, but he didn't let on. He didn't let anybody know that he gave a crap. And it was only after everybody left and there was nobody left to hear him say it that he finally sort of <laughs> said something about that. So there is depth. There is depth to Red 13. There is depth to Sid. There is depth to Barrett and um, Vincent and Yuffie and all those other characters in this game. It's just not uh, the character arcs in for a lot of these secondary or tertiary characters is not as stretched out through the entire game as it is in the case of Cloud, in the case of uh, Tifa or Aerith. Honestly, the... Um, uh, Final Fantasy VII isn't quite as bad with this as some other games are, but it's still something that I noticed. Anyway, thanks for watching.